Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining our event today to mark the launch of our report, Asia Data, data Transparency 2023, which assesses the state of data transparency in Asia Pacific and also Central Asia. You will hear from our speakers today why data plays an important role in accelerating decarbonization of the power sector. We'll also be inviting questions, so please use the Q&A tool and upload the questions you would like to hear answered. If you have any issues, you can message Amber Help Desk. After this event, Amber will also be sending out invitations for follow-up actions. And now without further ado, let me hand over to our moderator, Baraj Naik, co-founder of the Initiative for Climate Action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rini, and uh, good day and welcome to one and all. I'm delighted that uh, you're able to join me and all the others in this Zoom room today for this very momentous uh, occasion, uh, one that I have been looking forward to for quite a while myself, the launch of the Asia Data Transparency Report, and in some sense, the start of a conversation around data transparency in Asia and what we can do about it. So before I briefly introduce our key speakers and panelists uh, for today, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge what's really at stake uh, at the heart of this event and the conversation that we're about to enter into. I'm someone who uh, has uh, joined the cause of increased data transparency in the uh, power sector in Asia relatively recently. And my eyes really opened when I realized that um, a large part of coal consumption belongs to this part of the world and a lion's share of emissions uh, are attributed directly to the power sector. That said, even though everyone recognizes that a key lever for decarbonization is going to be uh, a transition within the power sector and data is so central to, to knowing the what, where, how, and when of that transition, data is simply not too easy to find. So I'm really delighted that this report that we're gonna get a sneak peek into today has uh, in some sense very, very clearly presented a picture of the state of data transparency across Asia. The format for the event today is we're going to primarily spend some time exploring the key findings of the report and uh, the two key authors of the report are going to take us uh, through that uh, with short presentations. We're going to also spend a little bit of time understanding the motivation behind this effort, what preceded it, the methodology followed, the scope of coverage, the key findings, of course, uh, some key examples that give us uh, paradigms or models of best principles that can be followed and emulated and the way forward. And after we have that short whirlwind key finding presentation from Uni and Justine, who I'll uh, introduce more properly in just a minute, we'll proceed to a, a very exciting panel discussion with a range of exciting panelists who I'd love to introduce you to. So that's the structure for our um, uh, event today will be uh, 60 minutes on the hour. Uh, we have firstly uh, our two key report authors offering the key findings of the report and it's my uh, pleasure and delight to introduce Yuni Lee uh, from Ember and Justine White from Subak who have really contributed this amazing work for us and will be taking us uh, through it as well. Before I hand it over to Uni, maybe I'd like to take this moment to also quickly introduce and welcome our phenomenal set of panelists. Uh, we have Jake Varma from Subak, Brenda Gupta from Vasudha Foundation, Samat Mar from Agora Energy Wind, Mohammad Mustafa Amjad from Renewables First, and Jeffraim Manansala from ICSC, which is the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. So without any further ado, let me hand it over to Uni for our uh, uh, introduction to the key findings of the report. Just a reminder to one and all, please, uh, throughout the course of today's event, uh, add your questions into the question box. 
we will have a component at the uh, second half of the session to, to really address those questions. Over to you, Yoni. Thank you, Abairash, and thank you all for being here with us today. Data is a big missing piece for solving Asia's decarbonization puzzle. With high quality power data, you can monitor electricity market trends and provide timely analysis. Also, organizations like us can track progress on clean power targets to hold governments accountable and raise their ambitions. It also benefits policymakers to make the policymaking process more evidence-based. And all of these activities are crucial elements that accelerate clean power transition. It is also important that data is open and accessible for everyone. Open data can foster innovation and scientific development by enabling multi-stakeholder participation, including entrepreneurs that develop smart technologies that can make the grid more flexible. And the need for data is particularly high in Asia since it is the highest emitter than any other continent, accounting for 62% of global power sector emissions. And this is largely attributed to its coal generation, about 80% of the global total. But we have heard from many, including our own Ember team and partners in the region, that power data in Asia is really difficult to find. And this shared pain point motivated us to write the second Asia Data Transparency Report in partnership with SUVAC. With this research, we aim to improve visibility on where power sector data can be found by collecting information on currently available power data sources. So we evaluated data transparency scores for 39 economies in the region based on that information. We hope that this research will be the evidence that prompts regional collaboration to improve data transparency in Asia. At the end of this webinar, we'll invite you to join us in our follow-up meetings to, dis to discuss what that could look like. Three research questions guided us in our research. First, how transparent is power sector data in Asia? In other words, how open, accessible, and up-to-date is power data in Asia? Throughout the report, we defined Asia region as Asia Pacific and Central Asia. Second, is high income a necessary condition for better data transparency? And finally, what can countries in Asia do to improve data transparency? In our research, we identified 74 sources in 39 countries through desktop research. And if we couldn't find any, we sent cold emails to country representatives and messages on social media platform and asked around in our professional network as well. We measured data transparency of each score and economy based on these six trading criteria. Time granularity, publishing lag. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, time granularity publishing lag, uh, representing up-to-dateness of data, geographical granularity, fuel breakdown, ease of access, and additional data. We used generation as the main data point while capturing availability of other metrics under additional data. All of the information we found is available in our Asia Data Finder. Please bear with us while we open the data tool for you. Uh, we, made, we made this data tool to help you find data yourself. You can search for a country or region of your interest in the tool. And the tool lists detailed information on the six rating criteria. If you scroll down, you will find overall scores by economy along with a written summary of that country. And this tool can be found on Ember website as, long, as well as SUVAX data catalog. Thank you. In our research, can you go to the next slide, please? In our research, we find that more than half, so 24 out of 39 economies in Asia, 
lack data transparency for the power sector. Five economies didn't have any data at all, and eight countries scored poor. The most common score was insufficient. Many high-income countries like Japan and Singapore scored only acceptable, and even the largest power generator in the world, China, as well. Only six countries scored either good or excellent, and those are Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, South Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand. The countries that scored very poor to insufficient are home to 684 million people. And we don't have enough data to ensure that clean power transition happens in these places. Even the acceptable score really isn't up to a standard that can unlock the data's full potential. And if we counted countries for which we don't have good or excellent data, that number would be as big as 2.7 billion, which correspond to 80% of Asia's power sector emissions. We also found that higher income countries generally score high on data transparency, as you can see in this positive correlation. Next slide, please. Um, but some lower income countries like India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka score higher than any other upper middle income countries. And this led us to take a closer look at the best practices of data transparency in Asia and how they made it happen. From this exercise, we extracted lessons that can be replicated elsewhere. The co-author of this report, Justine, will walk you through them. Thank you very much, Uni, and thank you very much, Abaraj, for that introduction as well. In particular, I would like to ask the question of how we get here. So next slide, please. How do we score a five on this rating criteria that we used? To begin with time granularity, our hourly data is essential for various flexibility mechanisms, such as demand response, as well as to increase the uptake of renewables. To give some examples of what this looks like in our research, Australia went beyond this hourly threshold um, through their open NEM portal, so their open national energy market portal, and published data every five minutes. Additionally, Sri Lanka published 15 minute data from their public utilities commission, which is fantastic to see that good quality energy data isn't always correlated with income level. To continue with publishing lag, real-time data enables us to perform timely analyses, increasing the relevance and responsiveness to any data. Australia continues to publish their five-minute data in real time, as seen here, whereas Sri Lanka publishes their 15-minute data in monthly blocks, which is not as useful, but the 15 minutes is incredible to see still. Next, there is also geographical granularity. Geographical granularity enables us to understand where the production is concentrated or lacking in a region. This isn't just for a particular region of the country, but also extends to what power plant is coming from. And furthermore, which unit inside a power plant or a boiler in the power plant that's coming from. This is what we call unit level data. Only a few countries published unit level data, but Australia again scored a five here. Here, for example, you can see the Araring coal power plant just outside of Sydney, which has four boilers indicated for the different shades of grey. While it's beneficial to have geographical granularity and know what power is coming from what power plant or what boiler inside a power plant, without fuel breakdown, it's impossible to tell whether this is thermal or renewable power. And for this, we're looking for a more granular than ember fuel breakdown. But what does that mean? So with breakdown, we have high level breakdown, which is renewables and fossil fuels, but we also have a further breakdown of these main energy categories. And further beyond that is what we consider better than ember. So going further, this again was Australia who gave a distinction between solar energy. You can see here a distinction between solar utility, which can be solar farms, as well as solar rooftop, which is on top of buildings. You can also see a great example here, indicated by the yellow, where it's necessary to have highly granular time data published in real time. Because as you can see for this particular day, it was perhaps quite sunny and solar power made up quite a substantial portion of electricity generation on Australia on this day. 
Additionally, New Zealand went beyond the mid-level breakdown, in part due to its abundance of geothermal energy. Next, there was also ease of access. So easily accessible data comes in any machine readable formats, which is a technical requirement for improving data transparency and increasing any automated workflows. In particular, for a score of five, we'd really like to see a public API here, but we'd also look for Excel spreadsheets or CSV files as well, as there are varied uses of the data. To give an example, India's Central Electricity Authority allows users to easily access an API for their data. Additionally, Australia also allows the data to be downloaded as a PNG, as well as a CSV file. Additionally, New Zealand's Electricity Market Authority also allowed their data to be downloaded in a CSV format, but included a permalink as well, enabling permanent and lasting access to the data, which is also necessary. Finally, while our study mainly focused on generation data, other power sector data is required to understand the power market as well. This can include many things, but is not limited to capacity, demand data, consumption by sector, as well as price. We can see some examples here, for example, from Pakistan, who published unit level capacity data, but unfortunately did not publish unit level generation data. The independent electricity market of the op operator of the Philippines also gave real-time demand data as well as supply data, which was great to see. Finally, New Zealand's electricity market operator also has extensive price level data sets. This leads us um, to our case study on Vasuda Power. And with the scatteredness of energy data in Asia, it's and it often coming from different providers within a nation, it can sometimes be difficult to aggregate data and for that matter, analyze a country's energy transition. Vasuda Power has been doing this since its introduction in 2018 and has recently partnered with Niti Ayog. We interviewed them as part of this report to demonstrate the success of a government agency collaborating with the climate not-for-profit sphere to increase data transparency. We also have a list of recommendations for other nations to follow, which are non-resource intensive. For those that don't know, the Vasuda Foundation is a non-profit energy and climate policy think tank, and as well as Niti Ayog, is a government agency whose mandate is to oversee the adoption and monitoring of India's sustainable development goals. Today, Vasuda and Niti Ayog's partnership sets an example for the rest of Asia, and Vasuda Power's dashboard is one of the best given its resources. It is a one-stop shop for India's power data. And through this, they have also successfully addressed many of India's challenges regarding power data transparency. We can already see researchers, campaigners, as well as policymakers hugely benefiting from this tool, setting an example for how important these tools are in understanding the status quo of nations journey to clean electricity transition. However, the Vasuda Foundation isn't stopping here. And there's future plans to collect data on energy use and consumer behavior requiring demand side data. This is more important than ever given Asia's rapid energy transition. It is also true that Vasuda Power's current energy dashboard will go through massive improvement as well through combining with Niti Aayog's current energy dashboard in the first quarter of 2024. This leads us to make some key recommendations that other nations can follow to increase their data transparency. The first in this case is removing all forms that have restrictions on access and mandating the data to be license free. We can also see this through the many forms of open access data. It is also necessary to use appropriate formats for data sharing and acknowledge the varied uses of the data. Additionally, there is making data available in one central location in these machine readable formats. For example, many countries may publish data for different months or different years in different data sets. Combining these all into one data set makes it much easier for analysis to happen. This also extends to the digitalization of archival materials, publishing them as bulk data sets with permanent and lasting access. For example, there are materials which are, have been recorded before the digital era and digitalizing these is essential. For example, Azerbaijan have gone past this and published data all the way back to 1913, which was really interesting to see. 
And finally, one of the most important recommendations is to use unique identifiers to avoid any erroneous interpretation of the data. For example, the Suda Power gave each power plant in India a unique identifier so that any data set which overlapped could easily be cross-referenced and seen if there were any discrepancies in the data being aggregated. I'd like to take this moment to thank everyone for tuning in thus far, and I'm sure our panelists have a lot to comment on from the report, as well as from their own experiences. I'm now going to hand back to Abaraj to take us into the panel discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Justine and Uni. That was, I think, a fabulous uh, intro, and I've uh, had a chance to scan through the report, and I, I can't uh, overemphasize how useful it already appears to be. I am quite uh, keen to spend a lot more time getting into the specifics of, of the coverage, including the country profiles and the very detailed recommendations. So as promised, we have a, a panel discussion to, to really get into some specifics and to allow for uh, the conversation around the core issue of data transparency for power data in Asia to begin in and through this event. Um, given that we have a, a fairly tight event, I'm going to uh, recommend that uh, each of our panelists spend not more than three, a maximum of four minutes in response to a question I'll pose, just so you have, uh, to each one of you, just so you have a sense of the order in which we'll go I'll uh, probably uh, start with Brinda Gupta from Vasudha Foundation, then move to Jeff Rhyme uh, from ICSC, then go to Samarth from Agora Energy Wind, then Jake uh, Verma from Suba, and finally, Mohammed Mustafa Amjad at uh, Renewables First. We will have, after each of the panelists has responded, we will have uh, maybe uh, 10 minutes or so for a slightly uh, more open conversation. And for that, your questions and comments are important to input into the Q&A box. But before I pose my question to Vrinda, if I may, Vrinda, with, with your permission, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, once again, the two organizations that were behind this report, because I didn't do so enough, I feel, at the start of the session. So. For those of you who might not be familiar, Ember is an energy think tank that uses data-driven insights to shift the world to clean electricity. And Subak is an impact multiplier for climate action, helping startups maximize their impact in the fight against climate change through funding, learning, and networking. And as someone who's been uh, very actively involved in building a state level electricity transition tracker for India. It's called Sketi, and some of my colleagues are also on this session. Both of these organizations have really been uh, uh, lifesavers and tremendous, tremendous inspiration. So just wanted to acknowledge uh, the, the hosts and in some sense, the fountainheads of, of the conversation today. That said, let me uh, pose my question to you, uh, Vrinda. Uh, Vrinda, I think, uh, what we're really uh, interested in uh, would be what was featured in the report and Justine took us through some uh, level of detail there. Your effort to improve data transparency in India has really caught uh, a lot of attention and was featured quite prominently in this report as something that all of us can learn from. We would really love to learn more from you on this call. Uh, about some of the challenges that you might have faced, uh, the barriers that you might have had to overcome. And uh, really, if there is uh, uh, some secret sauce that allows you to do all of this in the way that you have done. I mean, it's quite really a, a tremendous achievement to be in partnership with Niti Aayog and have your platform uh, available for a much wider uh, audience as well. So we'd love to hear from your experience. Thank you, Abhiraj, and uh, thank you, Ember and Subak, for you know uh, providing this opportunity and capturing our case study. And uh, we are really happy so that you know because we are able to reach it to an international audience and uh, talk about the data uh, transparency in India. Just to um, because I want to keep it short. Also, when we started this work on uh, uh, data in India, 
we wanted to answer three questions that why do we need the data? That part, I think, essentially, uh, the presentation is very aptly captured. What is missing in India? So when it comes to the power sector in India, what is missing in India? And we realize that there is a need uh, for more persistent data sets. There is a lot of data, but we need more persistent data sets, which are more periodical in nature. And the last is that there are a lot of data inconsistencies. Despite the amount of data that has been published, there are some data inconsistencies when you start looking at a granular level. And that's when we decided to start working in more in-depth uh, on a platform where we are able to not just aggregate the data, but also integrate the data on power, climate, and economy together. Because if we want to make change for India, at the climate level, want to India to achieve its climate goals. It's not just the energy sector that alone can do this. It has to do the talking with other sectors which are more towards uh, climate inclined. And definitely economy has a very important role for a country like India that is still developing in nature. So uh, that is when we decided to look at the what part. Lastly, the how part of it. So the how part of it uh, began way sooner and there has been multiple hiccups that we had faced. And to give you the diversity, India is a very big, and, and a lot of people studying data on India know that India is a very complex system, not just in terms of its power sector, but the expanse of the whole geographical uh, nature of the country is such that it goes across for 28 states, eight union territories, then it has almost... Uh, 330 million energy electricity consumers alone, let alone the big population of 140 billion. But uh, uh, we recently got electrified, 100% uh, electrified. And then we are looking at a host of almost 60 electricity distribution companies in India and almost about 450 power plants plus. So what I'm trying to tell you is that it's a very big and complex system that we are talking about. And in order to get understanding on the data patterns, each one of them has a way of representing every institution. It's a very complex exercise, which demands more, which is more both resource and time intensive. In terms of the challenges, the biggest challenge, um, uh, uh, what we found was that there are three, if I have to just portray in that sense, but three big challenges. One is the mapping of data. So when we are looking at the whole el electricity or energy data, the mapping of the data uh, exercise is a very arduous task. Why? Because uh, a lot of data is sparse and a lot of data is scattered under multiple departments. In India, what happens is for every fuel, for every source, you have different ministries that are governing it. And every ministry is coming up with some of its own uh, reports at the end of the year. And uh, uh, at the end of the year, they are coming with different reports. So it needs some assessment uh, that what how do we integrate those information second uh, public data in india is uh, very uh, has improved a lot but it is still behind those dashboards where the data is not easily accessible and also sometimes not updated that frequently and also there is a problem of data awareness which is a very big thing what happens is that CEA, Central Electricity Authority, which we also uh, which we also saw in the presentation, that is the main authority which is supposed to uh, aggregate all the data on the power sector, everything about all the sources. But when you actually spend time on those websites and go and talk to those people in different ministries, you find out that there is a lot of more exhaustive information at its Ministry of New and Renewable Energy as compared to a CEA. So those kind of awareness is also not there while the data is available. Third, uh, the and the sub, the most important, which led us to in, uh, integrate it, that data from different sources they do not talk to each other. So similar data is being produced, but they are not in a similar fashion that they can be integrated together and holistic. And then we could understand some holistic assessments for the sector. For example, if I have to put it here, um, so there are 60 electricity distribution companies in India, plus more than plus Brenda, around that. Sorry to interrupt, we're almost at time. So I'll request you to quickly yeah. conclude your- uh, Yeah, uh, just one point. And, uh, and all of them are producing operational and financial reporting at the end of the day for those. 
But in order to understand that how a state is managing and, and doing its power purchase or how a state is looking at its consumer uh, behavior on end use, the data is so diversified and in different formats that you're not able to look at a concise and look at an integrated analysis on that. So that is why we wanted to bring the data from those uh, PDFs documents or those not so machine ready documents to on that platform so that it's easier for users to look uh, power sector assessments in them. I'll stop here. Thanks very much, uh, Vrinda, and uh, I hope uh, we'll have a chance to return to uh, you uh, slightly later after we've heard from each of the panelists so that we can uh, get some more detail there. My my next question is, of course, uh, for, for Jeff. And Jeff, uh, you've heard of some of the uh, problems that Vrinda highlighted, and, and we are keen to, to hear whether, from based on your work, in the Philippines, uh, did you have similar such problems to encounter? And did you uh, come up with new responses to overcome these problems as well? We are quite keen as we proceed into the conversation to understand what really are the common linkages that uh, allow for us to make sense of the region as a whole. Hello, okay. So yes, actually there's a lot of uh, similarities on the challenges that we are encountering in the Philippines. Uh, and what, uh, what's uh, really uh, comparable is the data silos and the distribution utilities not talking to each other. So there's a lot of segregation of the data between different entities. And this segregation of data is making it difficult to merge different sources because of the different formats and prevents us from having more insightful results because they're scattered. Uh, as an example, in the Philippines, uh, we have a liberalized market and we have a lot of distribution utilities. We have double that of uh, India. We have more than 150 distribution utilities because we do have an archipelago and individual islands have different distribution utilities. So what we're seeing here is that many of these distribution utilities uh, do not publish their data. And if they do, their format is not really readily available for analysis. So that's really one of the issues that we are encountering. And this compliance issue creates data silos leading to significant variation in pricing of distribution utilities, even though these distribution utilities are adjacent to each other. So geographically, they are adjacent, but the prices of these distribution utilities that, are, that they are imposing to consumers are really significant for each other. So that's really one of the problems that we are deep diving right now. Uh, but this compliance issue that we are seeing, uh, we are seeing that this is not because that they do not want to post the data, but rather they lack the technical expertise to do so. That's challenge number two that we are encountering. These distribution utilities do not have the technical capacity to understand the data, the value of data that they have in hand. So they have insufficient training, they have inadequate infrastructure to support that data, and they have outdated equipment and making it difficult to collect and analyze data effectively. So this lack of technical capacity creates a barrier of data sharing and innovation, which hinders the development of data-driven solutions in the Philippines. Uh, so yeah, so I think those are the two main problems that we are encountering in the Philippines when it comes to data. And Jeff, uh, if I may just also have a follow-up there, why do you think uh, so many of the uh, uh, you know, uh, countries in Asia uh, are, are, are experiencing similar kinds of problems, either lack of capacity or lack of interoperability or, or, or lack of uh, access? I mean, would you have some reflections on a, a more uh, uh, regional perspective? That is, why are these similar problems surfacing again and again in different countries? I think it's because uh, basically we need to establish the governance of the, the data at the onset. So basically, I think these uh, organizations, distribution, distribution utilities was built not focusing on that they have to store, collect, and to analyze this data. They was just, these distribution utilities, this power, uh, 
organizations were built just to distribute power, just to do their specific jobs and not in the context of doing data analytics, data collection. So I think those priorities are not up to par to what the information age of the day requires. So I think that's one of the prob- uh, reasons why these organizations are encountering the similar problems. Thanks so much. That was uh, Jeff Prime Manansala, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to, to come back to you, Jeff. Uh, so I think that's uh, a great uh, segue into our n- next panelist. And uh, the big question for you, uh, Samarth, is, uh, uh, is it even uh, uh, something that, based on your own experience uh, leading a power data hub for Southeast Asian countries, and, and based on your experience of working with local partners, uh, where w- would one set the ambition and horizon of possibility with creating regional alliances that can encourage governments to improve data transparency? And uh, do you think this is possible? And if you do think it's possible, uh, in the limited time available, could you give us a sense of how do you think we could achieve this goal? Um. Uh, first of all, I would just quickly like to thank Ember and Subak for the great report. Um, I quickly went through it, uh, and like what you said, Abhiraj would love to dig more deeper into it. I think that's a, a quite a challenging task. We have to first recognize that uh, that we are we are undertaking something which is going to be challenging. Uh, the experience that I have had is working in the ASEAN region and collecting a wide range of uh, power sector KPIs and all the challenges that were listed by previous panelists, uh, we have encountered that. Now the question comes is, can we have a regional cooperation and what can be the horizon for that? I think this has to happen. Uh, I think, first of all, there is clearly a lot of benefit from having something like a regional cooperation. And we can, uh, and as our, as this community trying to push open data, we should bring forward that. Like, And what are the benefits that are coming from it in terms of capacity building, which was highlighted by other participants, uh, and so on. Uh, and then from the other side, we, we need to have uh, both top-down and bottoms-up approach in this. Uh, at a regional level, we need to have some sort of a framework uh, where countries are agreeing to collaborate on it. And there are already uh, some systems there. So for example, in Asia, there is ACE who has this mandate to work on this, uh, but they have their own uh, restrictions why they can't publish. Uh, so this is the top-down approach. Uh, and then on the bottoms up, what we want to do is enable and support institutions within countries and ministries to uh, basically, uh, in all the challenges that we already listed in terms of data collection, structuring, and so on. So it has to ha- ha- be a two-way uh, approach to doing something like this. Uh, and yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done at a regional level. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks very much, uh, Summer. And I think uh, we definitely uh, are hoping that uh, those promises uh, would feature in our, our follow-up conversation as well. Just a, a reminder that we will be sending out an invitation uh, for all who are in this uh, call today to, to join in and continue the conversation in a far more uh, progressive and uh, leisurely fashion without the constraints that we have uh, with time today. Um, so I want to uh, address my next question to Jake. Hi, Jake. And uh, I think uh, what we'd love to learn from uh, you and from your work uh, with Subak is on, on the, the big picture of, of data transparency and the impact that uh, it can bring about. I mean, uh, what do you think are the kinds of impacts that uh, better data transparency can bring about? What's really at stake here as we uh, advocate for increased data transparency in Asia? And based on your work uh, experience, uh, do you have a a good story or an example of of the kind of impact that could result uh, with increased data transparency? 
Yes, uh, I, I'd, I'd really love to um, take those questions, Zabaraj, and uh, thank you to my other esteemed panellists as well for their really interesting insight, and thank you for having me on here today. Um, so I'm speaking mainly from a UK and a European perspective. Um, the UK um, obviously has you know, a huge uh, role to play for historic emissions, but also has a great story in terms of uh, moving away and transitioning away from coal um, it, as that was a fundamental part of its economy for many years. And one of the points I wanted to highlight was its transition from the early 2000s, where coal consumption, although down from its high in the 1970s, was still plateaued, um, was still consistent until around 2012. And the transition away from coal from 2012 to today is quite a staggering um quite a staggering initiative and something that demonstrates that we can rapidly move away from coal as a method of um, both generating electricity and moving more towards renewable energy. Um, so one of the things I wanted to highlight was that increased access to data and transparency of data gives a sort of parity of information between government and the civil service and by external thinkers. Government doesn't have all the answers and, and nor should it, but also I think it's really important for the um, for researchers and for um, you know academ academia and think tanks and other sort of intellectual um, you know the intellectual economy has parity of information with the government so that they can bring fresh ideas and techniques and models of analysis to the specific regulatory agencies and the government that they may not have come up with by themselves. Um, and this can bring all sorts of benefits, you know, in the early sort of uh, 2010s in the UK, we had the Contracts for Difference scheme, which has been an incredibly successful economic scheme for crowding in renewable energy, and therefore um, moving away from coal and to a certain extent moving away from gas as well. Um, and this really demonstrates the kind of the power of open data and, and, and the UK's, uh, you know, data data transparency has been based quite a lot on uh, the EU data transparency. Obviously, we're not a member of the EU anymore, but um, being part of the um, the European uh, Transmission Network Operator Collective and having their data available on a 15-minute basis at a power plant level is a really powerful, um, gives, uh, you know, uh, people doing analysis within the EU and in the UK, a really powerful tool for understanding the mechanisms of how power is generated, but also how the market is operating. We have to remember that there's huge amounts of capital that are tied up in coal and gas generation, and that um, the transition away from that does have real, uh, you know, major economic impacts in the way that capital is deployed, the way that people are, uh, the way that labour operates, the way where people are employed, and that rolling that down um, requires a kind of very sensitive hand. Um, and a real robust approach to analysis, but also responsiveness to the emerging um, uh, to the emerging conditions uh, that may happen over the course of you know five, ten, fifteen years worth of rolling down of coal and fossil fuel consumption. Uh, so data is really key to having you know physical, real world impact into managing that both increase in um both increase in renewable energy but the decrease in fossil fuel consumption whether it's coal or gas or or anything else thanks so much jake and i i do hope we'll have a moment uh, before we close to to come back uh, to you for some additional comments and details i would love to now move to our uh, fifth uh, panelist uh, Mohammad Mustafa Amjad from Renewables First and welcome and uh, hello Mohammad so i would i think uh, uh, what i'd like to hear from you on would be uh, and and this is just continuing from from some of the comments that that Jake just presented uh, are you seeing uh, such transformative impact if you wish uh, possible in Pakistan, and could you also give us a little bit more context on uh, the state of good data in Pakistan, and does that uh, really support uh, hopes for a transformative change? And uh, finally, I'm also interested in uh, understanding more from you about some of the barriers we've we've come uh, across some of these in our earlier mm -hmm. panelists' comments as well. 
but what are some of the barriers that you are experiencing as you uh, make efforts to create uh, impact with uh, data? Thank you so much, Anirad. So um, let me start with this. So uh, in any transition from point A to point B, you know, uh, forget about energy transition in general. We need all sorts of information. We need uh, we need the stakeholders and the general public to understand the importance of that information and data. Uh, and that is perhaps one of the biggest challenges that I think uh, reports like these are also trying to address that. And that is the importance regarding the discourse. Uh, of data. Uh, that is something that, that we've been working on as well, trying uh, to, you know, make the masses understand the importance of electricity data in the first place. Uh, with Pakistan, with the current crisis that we are facing on the economic front, uh, a lot of it is rooted uh, within the electricity sector, you know, uh, the current account deficit is a direct response to electricity or fuel imports. Uh, you know, circular debt uh, has an impact uh, due to the fact that, you know, uh, again, a lot of the economy is dependent, uh, our ability to return uh, different loans and all that uh, are directly linked to the circular uh, debt. Uh, electricity prices are directly linked to the economic recession that we are facing. So a lot of it is rooted within the, within in the energy sector, within the electricity sector. And uh, that is why it's very important that the data discourse is happening at all levels of governance. It shouldn't be limited to a certain silo. Uh, it shouldn't be limited to, to the government or to the policymakers or you know, to experts. It should be something that should be uh, available to the general masses as well. As well. And, and that is why I think the second point that I wanted to highlight is that uh, once that discourse is there, data has to be analyzed. Um, it should be in a form which is uh, easy to, to do analysis on. It, it, is, it should be something that you know uh, you could analyze and then move to further insights. Uh, and for that to happen, again, uh, within Pakistan, a regulator, Nepra, um, it, it's, it's, it's doing a massive job of you know publishing a lot of the information. So uh, all public hearings are, uh, are published on their website. Um, the tariff documents are available on their website. But but then again, it's in, it's either available in a form which is not downloadable or these are uh, screenshots of PDFs that, that are published as images on the website. So how machine readable is it? How analyzable is this data? Um, even the state of industry report, um, which again is, is, is a major document that comes every year, uh, it has lots of charts, lots of information. Uh, but again, is it something that, that, that the general public can relate to, can understand, can analyze, can come up with their own uh, insights? That, that bit is missing, and that is something which I think Basuda is also you know, working on. Uh, presenting data in a way which which is accessible to the general public so that they can make sense out of uh, out of something very technical um, another thing that i wanted to highlight was um, uh, regarding modernization of data so as we're moving away from you know a central system to a decentralized system uh, within the energy transition um, it, you know, electricity data isn't limited to generation anymore. It isn't limited to capacity, demand side management, energy efficiency, things like these have taken center stage because now they become all the more important as we move to, you know, more modular forms of energy. Um, so you need data in a form which is easily accessible by uh, the different modular levels at which CN making has to be taken. Um, and that is something that that, that I feel um, that, that's about, uh, sorry, uh, someone also addressed, addressed with, uh, with the bottom approach that you, you cannot only have aggregated data at the top end you also want the masses to you know uh, have uh, so again data democratization is what i'm referring to here um, you know you need to have the masses uh, have the ability to collect their own data to analyze their own data and then uh, you know present it in a form which is aggregated at a central level uh, because across the whole region, I think it, it, uh, within the Asian region, we do have constitutions or we do, do have, you know, uh, legal hurdles where um, planning might be happening at a central level, but then again, execution is happening at a provincial level or a state level. So uh, a lot of the planning, the execution, uh, data collection is, is, the, is the job of provinces and states. So how do we, you know, bridge that gap that becomes all the more important through effective data collection? So I'll, I'll stop there and happy to circle that. Thanks uh, so much, Mohamed Mustafa Amjad from Renewables First. And I really uh, would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank each of the panelists. You all have been absolutely immaculate with time management. I dare say some of you might have uh, uh, 
uh, censored some of your comments because of uh, uh, efficient time management, but we are perfectly on time. And that means we have uh, a few minutes uh, at the end of this session to take some of the questions that have not yet been answered in the Q&A box. We've uh, had some great inputs there already around uh, standards and the possibility of standards, uh, some great references in response to a question that uh, Yuxing Pan has originally presented. One of the open questions that I would like us to perhaps turn to, this is from uh, Mathilde Dogji. Uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. And uh, the question uh, they posed would be one that I think uh, I'd like to direct towards uh, Jeff Prime. It looks like uh, there might be some technical uh, input there that, that would help all of us here. Uh, it's it's a it's a question that has come up uh, in some of the comments uh, as well from the panelists. That is quite often the data sources that uh, constitute uh, data in the power sector, in particular Asian countries, are uh, uh, quite mismatched or or not easily commensurable or uh, mappable onto each other. And and so uh, what we're really interested in uh, in a broad uh, overview sense of it would be what kind of data validation uh, is being implemented uh, by you, for example, in the Philippines? And, and what kind of data validation would be useful to keep in mind when one is thinking about these issues of uh, transition uh, along with the accessible information for all? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, uh, actually, this is a very common problem also in the Philippines because we do have a lot of distribution utilities and they ha sometimes have mismatches uh, when it comes to the data that they are posting or they are not posting. So what we do uh, is we need to identify the ground truth of the data. So identify the ground truth, who has the central authority on where can we validate the data sources. And in our case, what we do is we uh, rely on the electricity market, the spot market, on the dispatch schedules on the spot market, and compare that to the distribution utilities data. So by making a ground truth on the data sources and, and uh, basically pinpointing which specific data, data source will we 100% rely on, that would be uh, the best case to ensure that our data is validated. Thanks, uh, Jeff. And I think the, the other question is one that I'd really like to hear as many panelists as possible on. The, the question, uh, this is from uh, an anonymous attendee, is what are the benefits to these countries' governments uh, uh, from greater data transparency? Why would politicians uh, choose to follow this path? And I guess uh, uh, in uh, uh, Mohammed Mustafa's uh, comments, we did see uh, a hint of an answer perhaps in uh, constitutional and legal regimes. But I guess what I too am interested in is, is the, the, the leverage within the political economy and based on experience, why would countries transition and countries' governments transition to greater data transparency? So uh, if I may request uh, uh, Vrinda, uh, to and Jake and Samarth, I think all of what you'll have uh, shared is already relevant to this. But if you'd like to weigh in on this, uh, given your own work, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I think this is a very important question. But uh, I would like to say that there is definitely a lot of positive response from uh, uh, data transparency. Uh, so the dashboard, which is we are creating with Niti is still not been out, but the Vasudha dashboard has been there for almost two years. And uh, I have, we have testimonial evidence to say that states, state governments have reached out to us time and again to get data on what has been the, and, and because the data is so sparse that different entities need different set of data. So maybe a power sector person has 
the power sector department of the state has the power profiles, but not the, let's say, the other set of uh, energy de uh, utility department. So we have definitely a lot of uh, data we get on request gets. Uh, we get a lot of data requests from state governments uh, across the countries, country and uh, different departments. Niti Ayo themselves has, you know, have to report on some of the metrics at a uh, when there is strategy discussions happening at the national level or there is a response to the PMO. And more so, I think there is, we have heard from Jake and we have heard from uh, uh, Mustafa also that uh, all these uh, um, uh, data that we are trying to make it more transparent and available will be used for an informed policy discourse and an evidence-based assessments that we would try to do because it brings you, your understanding from bottom up, you know, what's happening at the grassroots level, who are my consumers, what appliance penetration has been there? Should I come out with a policy on five-star appliances? Should I do a market transformation program? All these are important uh, dimensions to which a policymaker needs data. And they need accessible and relevant data. Because if I'm an energy, if I'm a, uh, energy person, uh, uh, electricity person, I would might want to know the repercussions on my oil exports of the country. So there is a lot of in, uh, thinking that is there. So I feel that those are the key inputs for policy. That's why the governments would need uh, greater data transparency. Fantastic. Thanks, Rinda. Jake, uh, words from you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with Vrinda, um, and I think that, to be realistic, there's probably a tendency within within government to, uh, not, not across all governments, but there's a benefit to being open and transparent about how you've evidenced your policy decisions, and that that creates a robust conversation about where the flaws in the policy are, and how they can be addressed. But I think it's also fair to say that taking the question just at its, at its face, that there isn't always a benefit for governments to be more transparent about these policies. And partly because that is, as we know, there's a lot of capital deployed in fossil fuel development. There's a lot of vested interests in the production of fossil fuels within these economies. So it's not always within the government's interest to do so, but we know that if a government is committed to decarbonisation, that it is much more beneficial to create efficient economic outcomes and benefit for the, for the people of that economy to be more transparent so that that policy can be analysed. But I think it's it's also we do need to keep up the pressure for transparency because we know that when when policy is sort of hidden and it's behind closed doors and it avoids scrutiny, that it, it avoids the, the necessary crowding in of good ideas and often creates negative outcomes within that economy. So we really need to remember that, um, you know, government doesn't have all the answers. It, is, it, it should be a facilitator. And that if we start to be untransparent about government decision making, that's when, you know, uh, problems start occurring within the economy and within decarbonisation. The best outcome for decarbonisation is a robust intellectual discussion about evidence-based policy. Thanks, Jake, for that uh, dose of uh, realism into the conversation as well around some challenges that we might have to continue to work with. Samarth, uh, would you like to weigh in? We just have a few last minutes. Yeah, quickly, I would add just one small point. I agree with all. Uh, everything that was said. Uh, I think we have to recognize in working with the governments, they are recognizing this challenge in the analysis, for example, modeling work or anything that they also require for their policy design. The key is to have good data, like models are only as good as the data that fed, is fed into them is. There is a saying in modeling work called garbage in, garbage out. So, so I think there is a recognition for this and having more transparent data would also help governments in better exercises analysis that they uh, based on which the policies are designed. Thank you, Samat. We are at the end of our allocated time. Just a, a, a sort of summarization once again that uh, on the Q&A box, we had questions from Yu Xing Fan and Sam Hawkins, one on the access to data that might be commercially sensitive and second on 
uh, shared standards. And we see that in both cases, there are solutions and there are ways to surmount the barriers that our panelists have shared. I'd like to once again remind everyone that uh, uh, we will be following this conversation with an email to invite you to participate more fully and more uh, extensively in conversations bringing data transparency in the power sector in Asia to a much larger audience, and we would really love your participation and input. And finally, uh, once again, a huge, huge thank you to all our wonderful panelists, of course, to the two authors of the report, and to everyone really involved in making this event possible today. Uh, all, all, all of the support behind the scenes, including uh, Adi and, and Drini as well. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to continuing this conversation in the days ahead.